Thank you so much for tuning into this special edition of Speaking of Animals featuring wildlife photographer Susie Esterhaus. My name is JP Novick. I'm the executive director of the Center for Animal Protection and Education. And we decided to open up the show here down in the burrow pasture at the Cape Animal Sanctuary um, because most of the animals here in this pasture were at one time wild on public land. And um, we rescued them after they had been rounded up by the Bureau of Land Management. And with lots of time and patience, lots of patience, we've earned their trust. And now they follow us around with little puppy dogs. You can read all about their stories and all of the burrows here if you go to our website at www.capeanimals.org. But don't do it now, because I need your undivided attention. And what I'd like to do is just give you a rundown of what to expect in the next hour. I know there's some people on the call that haven't worked with Cape before, so the video will familiarize you with some of our programs. So first we'll show you the, the video, and while you're watching that, I'm going to run up to the house and meet you there. I'll give you a formal introduction to Susie. And then we're going to share with you a 27 minute interview that we did with Susie a couple of weeks ago. Actually, the interview itself was quite a few hours because I can listen to Susie talk, but just she's so interesting. And after the interview, she will be back on Zoom live to answer some of your questions. And then we have a little surprise for you at the at the end of the program. Um, Jackie put together some cute, funny bloopers for you. Some of them are from Susie's adventures, and some of them are from from Capes. We're really looking forward to the show, and thank you again so much for tuning in. In the Center for Animal Protection and Education, CAPE, has been saving lives by providing rescue, sanctuary, and advocacy for animals. The CAPE Animal Sanctuary in Grass Valley, California, is a permanent home for many animals who are older or who have special needs. In the summer of 2018, Daisy, a goat who had been so neglected that her hooves became overgrown, forcing her to walk on her knees, was welcomed to the sanctuary. With frequent hoof trimming and veterinary care, she is now walking comfortably. Cape also provides sanctuary for a herd of burros who at one time roamed freely on public lands. These animals were cruelly rounded up by the Bureau of Land Management in order to utilize the land for cattle grazing. CAPE's dog rescue program rescues dogs who are older or have special needs. In the fall of 2018, Greta, covered in tumors, was huddled in a kennel at an overcrowded shelter. She is now safe in a CAPE hospice foster home where she will live out her life. CAPE's Rough and Ready program works closely with animal shelters and animal protection organizations to evaluate and transfer dogs from overcrowded shelters to shelters with ready adopters. CAPE provides needed medical care, spay and neuter services, and transportation for the dogs brought into this program. In 2016, CAPE and Compassion Without Borders, an international dog rescue organization, co-created Matopia, a shelter for rescued dogs based in Santa Rosa. Matopia, which has 53 kennels on three acres, temporarily houses dogs taken from dire situations while they await transport to Cape Foster Homes or into Cape's Rough and Ready program. This collaborative project will save the lives of thousands of dogs. CAPE's mission to protect and advocate for all animals has defined our efforts. Through our outreach and campaigns, CAPE's aim is to encourage people to recognize the inherent value of every living being. CAPE's philosophy encompasses the ideal 
that every animal has the right to live out their natural life free from suffering. I have followed Susie's incredible career for more than 20 years, a career that's taken her all over the world to places that most of us will never go to in our lifetime. Her photographs allow all of us to get a close-up glimpse into the lives, relationships, and environments of animals around the globe. Her images have been published in over 100 magazine covers and feature stories and publications such as Time, Smithsonian, and Popular Photography. Susie has won many awards and acknowledgements, not only for her beautiful photographs, but for her contributions to environmental protection and conservation. She's written 19 books, and she's just published a brand new book called My Wildlife, Adventures of a Wildlife Photographer, a book aimed to reach seven to 10 year olds. But I read it cover to cover two nights ago, and it is beautiful. It's a page turner and I couldn't put it down. I interviewed Susie a few weeks ago and I'm so delighted to share excerpts of the interview with you. Remember, after the interview, Susie is happy to answer some of the questions you've submitted via the chat box. I am sure you will be inspired by Susie's work. Susie, welcome to Speaking of Animals. It's so nice to see you, it's even on Zoom. Oh, so great. It's always great to see you. Lots of questions after reading your book. And I just, I love the way the book is put together. The photographs are beautiful. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in animals and photography and specifically wildlife photography? I was one of those strange kids that knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, I think I was around six years old when I told my parents that I was going to go live in a tent in Africa. It was also around that time I got my first uh, point and shoot camera and I was um, taking pictures in my backyard, like really, really young um, of, of squirrels and birds and things like that. And also of um, domestic animals. So domestic animals were a huge part of my childhood and a big part of my life even today. Um, I grew up in a family where we always had like five rescue dogs and um, a couple rescue cats. And, and those were my first um, real sort of portrait subjects. And I would often like pose my cat in this setting in the backyard and tell my mom it was like a tiger in the Indian jungle. And, um, and then I, you know, in college, um, you can't just major in um, wildlife photography in college. So I, I actually did an environmental studies degree and um, I had almost a fine art mi minor, essentially, because I took so many photo classes at UC Santa Cruz. I knew that I needed a day job while I sort of tried to make my way into this career and built up my portfolio. And um, luckily for me, that, that day job was the Santa Cruz SPCA. This was a really good job to land for me because I got to be with animals and I could play with puppies and kittens all day. And um, did the pet of the weeks. Um, so I took photos of all the adoptables. Um, and then that is obviously when I met you too and, and started to get involved with Kate. Um, and I just want to say for, you know, organizations that are close to my heart, Cape is one of the closest. Um, I've held Cape dear for, what, I think it's like 20 years now. Um, More than that. Yeah. So, um, you know, what you guys do for, for domestic animal rescue is um is really powerful and very valuable and you've done so much we always love it when we get to have you as a guest i think some of the people that are with us today um might be interested in becoming wildlife photographers talk about and i could listen to you talk about this forever about what some of your most memorable moments are from your career as a wildlife photographer of course the dramatic ones stand out you know where you know getting charged by grizzly bears or, you know, I had a situation where an alpha male chimpanzee charged me and sort of slapped me as he walked by, or as he charged by. Um, and, you know, dramatic things like that tend to stand out. Um, but the ones that I, clo that I hold closest to my heart are actually quiet moments. I think we've all had situations where we been over to a friend's house or a family member's house and there's a newborn infant there and you walk into the house and it's just 
this cocoon of calm and love and you, you've entered babyville. Everyone's speaking hushed and gentle. And, and that's no different than a, a den in the wild. Um, that has that same energy and that same vibe. But there's the treasured moments of just maybe seeing uh, cubs for the first time. I'll never forget when I saw um, tiger cubs for the first time um, in India, the, the cubs that we had been searching for for 10 days. And then, you know, they're them running out of the den. I sort of, you know, just barely being able to really see things well and seeing them for the first time um, is something that I will really hold dear forever. You know, you talk in, in your book, I have the book here, by the way, which I love, I'm ordering many copies, um, just how, how you prepare when, when you yeah. go off to some, you know, faraway place, how you prepare and how much you have to learn about their behaviors in advance so that you know what you're looking at. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? There's a lot of preparation. And I think that's something people don't really know about this job is how much preparation there is. And sometimes it's um, a preparation of just getting necessary permissions and, you know, film permits and, and uh, working with certain people on the ground. That could be years in the making of some of these projects, especially these endangered species that are really protected by governments, rightfully so. Once you have permission to be wherever you are, before you get on the ground, there's a huge amount of research that I always do. Um, and that, that can be scientific journals, reading them, reading books on the subject. But what I try to do is I try to know as much about my subject's behavior as possible before I go into a situation with them, because it's very different. You know, there's some universal commonalities with animals when they look spooked, but there's also some, some major differences that can be really misunderstood. And the example I always like to give, a lion yawning versus the grizzly bear yawning. A lion yawning, you know, that's a usually a fat, content lion just, you know, lazing around, yawning, pretty, pretty happy. Um, a grizzly bear yawning is an actual sign of stress and can be a pre precursor to charging. And so if you're, if you're in close proximity to a grizzly bear and that grizzly bear starts yawning, it's time to really start paying attention and maybe just start slowly moving back and giving the animal a little bit more space. So knowing, knowing the behavior of my subject keeps me safe, but also it helps me predict what they may do next. You know, this leopard mom likes to, when she'll go up into a tree, she'll actually, she'll get her body into a certain position and I know that she's going to jump or I'll know when she's gonna come down just by certain position or um, you know, she'll usually get up, yawn, and then I know she's gonna come flying down that tree. Happens really fast and you might miss it if you don't know these things. But being able to predict what the animal might do next makes me a better photographer as well. You also um, mentioned in, in the book about how important it is that you not disturb you know, their habitat. Can you talk a little bit about how that's done, where you're sort of respecting their space, you're trying to, you know, get the 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 shot. Every animal is different, so there's some there's some sort of species wide things like we usually um, brown bears that live in interior areas that are food stressed. We give them a lot of space because they're just they're uncomfortable, they're grumpy, they're hungry. We're all grumpy when we're hungry. And then and then there's but there's others where it's like there's actually differences between the individuals. And I think that's one thing to remember is that these animals are individuals. They're not species. They are individual beings and their personalities are totally different. You can have a leopard that is incredibly shy and doesn't even want to be seen by a vehicle and then you can have another leopard that is incredibly relaxed, quite bold, brazen, and even curious around vehicles. And so knowing the individual and what to expect from the individual can help. But even if you don't know the individual, just being able to, to read their behavior. But generally when I go into situation, particularly because I'm working with newborns often or young babies, um, we all know moms of all species with little ones can turn into total mama bears. And you can get a mom that is really relaxed, but she's got a newborn and she can be hyper vigilant. 
And so I will go in as gently as I possibly can. I'll try to control a few things. One, my energy. Um, I'll try to leave bad energy at the door. If I'm hyper or anxious, I try to calm myself because I believe animals pick up on that. In fact, I know they do. My movements will be really slow. And that can just be like simply getting something out of my bag. I do it very slowly instead of grabbing something. Generally speaking, animals don't like rapid movements. Mm. Um, another thing is, you know, you go to photograph an animal, pick a camera up and point it at the animal. You don't do that really quickly and really rapidly because a lot of animals don't do that. A lot of animals have had bad situations or a history of hunting. So that kind of behavior can seem predatory to them because it's a danger. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of different things that, that I do to keep my presence um, very non-invasive. And so to me, the ultimate goal with any animal is that I go into a situation and whether I can acquire it in a few hours or a few days or a few weeks, I try to get that animal comfortable in my presence. Sometimes that only takes a few minutes. Other times it's taken me up to 17 days to get a shy animal comfortable with me. But I go in very, very slowly. I keep a distance, only get closer when they've been relaxed. And a general golden rule when you're approaching an animal is if you take a few steps forward, they stop, they look at you, they go back to what they were doing before and they stop paying attention to you. You're not impacting them. You're not stressing them out. Um, and you're not, you're not being invasive. So if they carry on with their natural behavior, then you're not harassing them. So there's these things that I do to make sure that they're comfortable with me being there. And for me, the ultimate goal of any project is that I just become part of the landscape. They're so used to me. They're so used to seeing me and they're so not threatened by me that I almost become a boulder in their landscape or like a tree. Mm -hmm. They stop, they don't look at me, they don't pay attention to me. They just live out their lives and I'm a fly on the wall. That's the ultimate goal. Um, I never want to be in a situation, we all accidentally do things, but I never want to be in a situation where I'm stressing an animal mm -hmm. and impacting their behavior. Because let's face it, these animals have enough challenge as it is um, and we don't need to be putting more on top of them. When you go out um, on, on, on a project, are you mm. alone or do you have a team of people working with you? So it depends. It depends on the project. Um, sometimes I'm alone and other times I work with a tracker or a guide. Um, sometimes I work with researchers. So it completely depends on the project. I think when I was younger, I worked alone a lot more than I do now. And some of that was necessity. I just couldn't afford a tracker or a guide. Um, and, and also too, you know, I was spending months and months and months solid without a break. I can expedite finding my animals and expedite good photography by employing local guides and trackers. The other nice thing about using local guides and trackers is that you're giving back to the community and you're supporting the economy. A lot of these economies are based on tourism. So if I go in and I employ a tracker for a month, um, that's a huge contribution to the community and it's making tourism more valuable. And this is an ideal situation that we want all over the world where these animals are more valuable as tourist subjects than they are as a pelt or a trophy. And so that really helps bring money back. But yes, occasionally I am, you know, I do work alone quite often. You know, ring-tailed lemur, it's easy because they all have their babies at once in September. And so you go and you follow a ring-tailed lemur troop and it's like exploding with babies, right? So that kind of, that kind of subject is really easy. A, a, a solitary animal that's quite elusive, that's a much more difficult project. And that's where I'll try to have people on the ground that are informing me and letting me know if an animal is pregnant. My leopard project, there's no way I could have done it without my tracker. Um, his, na his name is Kambango and his nickname is Delta. He grew up in the Okavango Delta. He knew this leopard like the back of his hand. He had followed her since she was two months old. He knew where she liked to have her cubs. He knew where she liked to hang out. Um, and he was also incredible at looking for her tracks, figuring out what she was doing, 
I, I have some basic tracking skills, but there is absolutely no way I could have succeeded in this project without Delta's help. No way. You know, these are, that's where I get my greatest joy is when I can follow these animals for a long period of time. And the leopardess, we, she's referred to as the camp female at Tubu Tree Camp in Botswana, the one that I've currently been doing so much work on. It's like over two years now, obviously not two years solid, but keep going back over and over again. I think six different trips so far um, over two years and, and really being able to immerse myself in her world, not just the leopard's world, but her world for that long period of time. And there's something insanely beautiful about that to me. I know that people are very interested and you talk about it quite a, a, a bit in the book. And I love this part where you talk about some of the, you know, some of the living situations that you're in you yeah. know, on some of these projects. Cause some of them sound quite rustic. Yeah. Can you talk a yeah. little bit about that? Yeah. So, I mean, it's fun and it does get, it can get trying. Uh, in college, I had some exposure to this really early on. You know, I did a semester abroad program where I stayed in a, in a Maasai village in a, in a mud boma and I didn't bathe for 30 days and um, we barely had enough water to drink and it was incredibly rustic, but also an incredible experience. So I got comfortable with situations like that really early on. My longest stint was a, a period of three years where I stayed in a bush camp in Kenya's Masai Mara. This was like a, a military sized tent where you could stand up in it, um, probably the size of a, I would say a, a very small bedroom, but you could stand. And there, I actually even had like a little wicker thing with shelves in there. And I had a cot that I slept in. And then I had a little basin that I would have water and, and sort of be able to do sponge baths and stuff. And I started off having a shower in the trees. And then eventually when I sort of started to think, okay, I'm going to be here for longer. I started, I thought I would be there a few months and I wound up staying a few years. And when I made that decision, I wound up um, having some guys build like a little concrete wall so I had privacy um, in the bushes you know people are like well how could you live without a toilet for three years and it's like well or without electricity for a year and a half it, it doesn't all those little all those things are just sort of minor because I'm so passionate about pursuing my subject that those inconveniences they don't phase me they don't they don't stop me they don't bother me I'm just like laser focused. And I actually, when I go into these situations, I, I dress um, appropriately for the culture. I may not wear the the dresses that ladies do in Africa, but the point is, is that I, I don't show any more skin than they do. Um, if I'm in a modest culture, I dress very modestly to be respectful. It's not just a matter of safety. It's a matter of, of respecting the locals and showing them um, that I respect their way of life. And that helps me get inroads to making connections that helps me with, with my job. You have incredible patience because I know you've talked to me before about just waiting, sitting, waiting quietly, you know, trying not to move, not to disturb for hours and hours on end. I mean, it does take a certain sense of um, you know, quietness and, and respect to yeah. be willing to do that. It's well, that or insanity. I'm not sure which. <laughs> I mean, before the pandemic, I was with this leopard mom, the same one I've been talking about. And she, I was, I had followed her previous litter. They had grown up to adulthood. Leopards are very, very secretive, very elusive, and notorious for hiding their cubs very, very well. You know, we had one spot where she had him in really thick bush and tall grass. I think that spot was five days. So that is 14 hours a day sitting there and staring at that bush and staring at the grass and seeing nothing. Now, if we were lucky, maybe mom would come in and out and go hunting. But if not, we would just literally see nothing during that day. Now you're seeing a lot. You're seeing birds go by and you know, you're seeing the dung beetles down on the ground and you're feeling the wind on your face. But um, it is a, a very um, zen time. She, she'd had another spot where she did the same thing for 11 days. Um, 
And so those 11 days, I'm not going to lie, they're long. They're really long. Um, and there are times where I feel very, very bored. But um, most of the time, I don't. Most of the time, I actually just love being out there. And that's the thing about those days is that they're not long and torturous because you're so present. We're very not present in our modern lives. Honestly, I had very little presence in my modern life at home, uh, doing my you know office work, editing. But in the field, I had incredible presence. Is there? I know you're. We're not supposed to interact with animals in in a physical way. But are there ever times when you do like physically, you know, touch? one of the subjects? Generally speaking, no. It is, it's a major no-no to touch your subjects. Cheetahs are notorious for when they get really used to a vehicle, they'll, they'll do things like jump on the hood. And what they're doing is they're, they're actually looking out um, and using that elevated platform to see prey coming in the grass. Sometimes they do it to see predators coming in the grass, but most of the time they're just looking out for prey. And I would have um, the cubs that grew up around me sitting sometimes on the roof and then my window would be open and, you know, I would get like this little tail hanging in and the tail would just like flicker and it would hit my neck, right? Brush against my neck. And I would just be like, oh my God, I want to touch that tail. And then I would have, I literally had a situation where the cub tried to paw me very playfully, very non-aggressively. He was just trying to that my shoulder, I so badly wanted to, you know, just kind of go like that, Tim, and play back. But I didn't because you you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, if I do that and get that cheetah comfortable with human touch, he might start approaching people. If he does that to tourists, it's probably not a big deal. If he goes outside the national park and does it in a village, he could get shot doing yeah. that. I mean, people would be, you know, justifiably terrified. Um, so um, this is this is how animals get in trouble. So generally speaking, we don't do that. The exception to that to that rule are orphans. Um, orphans, wild animal orphans, they need most of them need to be cuddled, or they're not going to thrive. Um, they need that sort of maternal touch. In, in in certain wildlife hospitals, I've had you know, hey, will you cuddle this joey? You know, koala joey, and I'm like. Yeah, yeah. I'm not that, <laughs> yeah. Right. There's that beautiful photo in here of you with the baby polar bear. Right. And so that was a situation where a scientist said, hey, you know, he had tranquilized this cub for science work. They were, they were doing blood samples and fat samples. And this is a critical study linked to global warming and polar bear decline. And um, that, that cub, his body temperature was um, going down and he was you know, drugged and, and they were concerned about him. And so he said, hey, will you, will you hold this polar bear cub? And I, I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna How say- How many no people to get that. asked that question, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like, you snuggle this polar bear cub for a little bit. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. One thing that we really educate people about is to not do these um, wild animal selfies. You know, we have these awful situations where lion cubs are, are bred for profit and you'll find them in, in Mexico, places in South Africa, um, where somebody, and even in places in the United States, Oklahoma, you know, the whole Tiger King thing, you know, go snuggle a, a tiger cub and get your photo taken with this tiger cub. And you know, these animals are often kept in horrible conditions and drugged. And so I do a lot of work for the Sloth Conservation Foundation. And this is a huge problem with sloths where um, locals are, are making money from taking sloths out of the jungles. And then on the roadside, you know, where there are a lot of tourists, they will charge tourists $10 a pop to hold a sloth and get a photo taken of a sloth. What the tourists don't know is that these guys don't know how to care for the sloths. Sloths are very specialized eaters. Usually they die after a few months of being in the person's care. And then the person just goes out and get another sloth. So it's a, it's a really um, tragic situation that's happening all over the world with multiple species. You have um, a started your own nonprofit, Girls Who Click. Yes. I think so I, I love, well, first of all, I love the name. But tell us a little bit about that. I don't know when you have time to do all this, Susie. You're incredible. So, but I want to hear about Girls Who Click. I launched this in 2017. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. 
And basically um, what a lot of people don't know about wildlife photography is that it's male dominated. This was obviously challenging at points in my life. Um, it is not easy being a minority, I think in any field. I started doing these free non, uh, sorry, free wildlife photography workshops for teen girls in Monterey. This is before I launched Girl to Click. And I just did it because I thought this is one small way that I can maybe influence some girls. What I wasn't prepared for is the contribution the girls would make in my life. Um, because I was so inspired at the end of those workshop days. I was like, how can I bring this into my life more? Then I got this idea of, wait a minute, what if I start a nonprofit and then women all over the United States that are professional nature photographers could do something in their hometown, something very similar. And so I put something out to my colleagues and they were, they were on board. And so I started Girls Who Click and we run these free uh, wildlife or nature photography workshops for teen girls throughout the United States. And I'm, I'm super proud of um, all the girls we've been able to reach and, and what we've been able to accomplish. I bet you inspired many. So Susie, as, as a way of wrapping up, there's two, I have two questions that yeah. I really want to slip in here. Yeah. One is um, for kids that are watching today and are going, you know what? That's what I want to do. So how can they get started? Where do they begin? I think one of the greatest, I actually believe the greatest threat to the planet right now is the disconnect with nature, particularly with children. Um, there was a bit of a disconnect in my generation and with every generation, it's more and more profound. And we, we, we cherish, we protect what we love. And if we don't love it to begin with, we're not going to protect it. It's just that simple. You know, hang out in the garden, do some gardening, hold insects, break open owl pellets, discover poop, look for tracks, go to nature camps. Um, that is so fundamental to this job. A lot of our girls come to these girls who click workshops with smartphones. These smartphones are incredible in terms of cameras these days. So you don't even need a proper camera. Not everybody has the budget for that. And you can do a lot on a smartphone, but get outside and shoot as much as you possibly can and learn as much as you can about nature. I just think anybody who gets to uh, listen to you, watch you, read your books, it's just, you're so inspiring. It's amazing. Susie, tell us how how people can order the book so you can find my wildlife um, on there, there's two ways so you could get signed copies on my website or you can get unsigned copies on amazon so if you go into amazon you can just type in my wildlife or you can go into my website and just click on books and get a signed copy there this is what the cover looks like it's susie with a bunch <laughs> of meerkats <laughs> behind her not cooperating those meerkats no, were no, not no, cooperating pointed the wrong direction <laughs> I cannot thank you enough for what you do. You just um, really blow my mind. And I, I really want to thank you for coming on Speaking of Animals. Well, thank you. I love what CAPE does. And I hope everybody who's watching will look into CAPE, learn more about CAPE, support your programs. You know, domestic animals, they're all, they're all part of it. Wildlife and domestic, it doesn't matter. They're all animals. We love them all, don't we? We do. We do yeah. indeed. And have a safe travels. I know you're leaving for Costa Rica soon. Yes. Um, I know you know you. how to stay safe. So thank you so much, Susie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, JP. See what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, I'm going to live my life vicariously through, through Susie's photographs. Um, so we're back live. And we've um, got some questions that have come in. So we saved a few minutes so that Susie can answer the questions. And the first one is from Diana. She wants to know, could you please share what kind of photo equipment you use? Um, so there's a lot of gear. There's a lot of really long lenses, um, a lot of heavy stuff that I carry around. So I carry around about 37 pounds of camera gear in my backpack and um, most of it is Canon. And I use um, 500 mil lens, uh, 200 to 400, um, 70 to 200 smaller lenses. So lots of different gear depending on the subject. Okay, Jack wants to know, what is your favorite animal? Um, my favorite animal is always the one 
that I am working on. So it changes all the time. So I'll, right now it's leopards because I've been working on leopards for the last two years. But if you asked me before that, it would have been tigers. So it just changes constantly. Sloths are kind of one of my ongoing favorites. I keep doing, you know, I was with sloths about 10 days ago. I keep doing a lot with them. So it's really dependent. I fall in love with all my subjects. So it's dependent on who I'm in love with at the time, I guess. I knew you'd have a hard time picking one, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this question is from Lucinda. She wants to know, is contacting a wildlife organization a good idea if you find an injured or possibly abandoned animal? Yeah, 100%. So you want to contact your local wildlife rescue organization. They're always going to know best what to do with it. Every community has a wildlife rescue group. And a lot of times we think, oh, well, I can take care of this bird. I found this bird, I can take care of it. And then we don't realize that, you know, birds can, can their temperature can be really, really sensitive. And so, you know, you keep them in a little box with a blanket, it may not be enough. And so I think, you know, we think we know how to take care of these creatures sometimes, but we really don't. And we should really leave it up to the experts. So absolutely. And really, it's so amazing how many wildlife rescue groups there are just quietly working in every community, not asking for a lot of recognition or thanks and saving so many wild animal lives every year. Really important point, Susie. We've contacted our uh, local wildlife uh, rehab center here on multiple occasions and they always have gotten back to us to let us know that the animals survived, that they've been released. I mean, I'm so impressed with our organization that we work with here. Yeah. So, um, okay, Susan would like to know what organizations do you support? Okay, so um, besides CAPE, of course, um, I support a handful of organizations. So basically I, I got asked for support early on in my career and there are so many organizations in need and you can't help them all. So I chose about a dozen favorite organizations that I help over the years and I committed to helping. And so there's there's a variety of different ones. Some of my favorites are the Sumatran Orangutan Society, the Sloth Conservation Foundation, Cheetah Conservation Fund, Wildlife Conservation Network. There's a lot, but you'll see them on my website, on my bio, you'll see who I'm supporting. And then if you follow my social media, you'll see that I'm raising awareness for different groups. So you can learn more, learn more about them that way too question for you. I'm not sure who it's from. Um, the question is, how has COVID affected your photography? Have you seen it affect wildlife at all? So, um, yeah. So, okay. First of all, COVID definitely has affected my wildlife photography and the fact that I am grounded. So right when the pandemic hit, I was actually with a the leopardess um, and, and her new cub and her cub was about a month old and I would have stayed longer. The pandemic kicked off um, and countries started closing borders. I didn't want to get stuck in Botswana away from my mom. I wanted to come home and make sure that she was safe. So I got, um, I you know came home and since then prior to this Costa Rica trip, I have been grounded. So that means a lot of my trap, first of all, my travel has stopped, but also a lot of projects um, that I thought would be unrelated are not. The ripple effect of COVID on photographers is pretty extreme. And so certain things that you would think wouldn't be dependent at all on COVID are. So I was supposed to have three books that were going to come out this fall and two out of the three got delayed until 2021 because of COVID. So there's, um, I think just like any industry, COVID has affected photographers um, on, a, on a really deep level. Oh, sorry, and I didn't answer the wildlife part. So the wildlife part, you know, I'm not on the ground in places um, where I would see these things. I'm here in lockdown trying to take care of my mom here in Northern California. I do hear stories, um, some good, some bad, from the places where I do regularly work about COVID's impact. But the biggest thing I think that I hear over and over again are these economies that relied on tourism. Um, like in Sumatra, they basically they don't have any income right now. The guides are unemployed. Um, and so it's, a, it's an absolutely um, devastating thing for the, for the economies throughout the world that rely on tourism. Susie, um, another question has come in. How do you prepare for different climates? Well, 
I have a four page master packing list that has everything I would need for any climate. And I just go down the list and check it off. So, you know, check off snow boots. Do I need snow boots? No, I actually, you know, maybe I need tropical weather clothing. So I'm prepared for anything here. Um, and then I, you know, just, just adjust. But I think it's funny because our bodies don't adjust as well as our minds sometimes do. So, you know, going from, I did have a, a time where I went from a tropical environment and two days later I was in an Arctic environment and my body didn't like that at all. I was, I'm very prone to being cold. I was more cold than I normally would be and my skin absolutely hated it. So it's, it's quite interesting taking your body from one extreme to another. Um, it sometimes takes a little longer to adjust than your mind does. That picture of you with the baby polar bear and you're wearing that gigantic jacket. I mean, it, you can feel how cold it is in that. That's no uh, joke. It was my was it you were. that day. Yeah, it was cold. Oh, this is, what are the ethical challenges faced when capturing images? I can't read this. I can see it in the chat, um, JP. It's actually uh, captioning images for markets. And so um, what he's asking is, is about um, captioning and truth and captioning issues, which is really a, a photographer specific question that's really um, kind of a niche photographer thing. But basically what he's talking about is whether or not we're truthful in our captioning. And this is where um, lots of captive animals will be photographed and people will pretend that they're wild animals. Um, and not state on there that, that this is a captive animal. And, the, and this actually leads to an animal welfare issue um, with these horrible places called game farms in the United States that will keep captive wild animals for profit. So usually things like mountain lions, wolves, coyotes, and these places will literally keep them and breed them specifically for the purposes of photographers coming in and photographing them and pretending that they're wild. So it's a, it's a very unethical practice on many different levels. It's misleading people, but also these animals are um, historically kept in terrible conditions and not cared for. Um, and these all of these game farms have had numerous animal welfare uh, violations um, in terms of how they're keeping their animals and how are they caring for them. So this is a, a very old fashioned practice that's getting phased out by younger photographers. Um, most photographers my age and younger don't use game farms anymore because we know that this is a highly unethical way to operate. Susie, I'm getting the cue that we need to wrap up our Q&A. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to remind everybody that we've got some bloopers coming up, but first I want to thank you so much for everything you do to bring these incredible images uh, to us, we know that a lot of animals are becoming extinct, and your photographs will will live on forever. And um, I, I I so respect what you do and how you do it. And so thank you for for just all your in, in incredible work, Susie. Um, I also want to thank our crew here today. Um, this episode of Speaking of Animals was quite. Um, um, a little more complicated than our, our normal our normal shows. And I really want to thank Jackie Howard, who did all the editing and a lot of yeah. the videotaping. Um, Hilary Alfie Sharp is here today as our camera person. Um, we've got Marie and Susan and Lori. Um, they're off-site on computers, helping us funnel some of the some of the important questions and technical aspects. So Susie, thank you so much. You are such a gift. Thank you so much for having me. I love you guys. You know that. We love you insanely. <laughs> now let's enjoy some bloopers. There's some good ones of Susie.
bunch of rain. In fact, it Any might have moment. just started raining. Yeah. That's Any good. second. Yeah. Which could thwart the whole thing. <laughs> Fuck. There's a spider! It's right there! taken many visits with our trusted vet and farrier. Did I forget something? Oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. 